So, <clears throat> welcome to my talk, Evolving ROS for Safety's Critical Systems. Um, my name is Tully Foote. I work at Open Robotics, and we're the, I'm more on the company, but we're the driving force behind ROS and Gazebo and a bunch of other open source software for robots. Uh, just to give me a baseline here, how many of you are familiar with ROS? Okay, how many of you use ROS? Cool. How many of you have gone through a process of certification for any standards bodies like the FDA or the FAA? Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I, in grad, uh, college and grad school, worked on autonomous cars for the DARPA Grand Challenge. It was really awesome. Back in the early 2000s, we were driving around in the desert and then city type environments, strapping sensors on cars and hopefully not crashing them into things. Um, after I graduated, I moved on to out to Silicon Valley and started to work at Willow Garage. Uh, the main platform that we worked on there was the PR2, a humanoid robot. It had two humanoid arms, but wheeled base and could drive around. Uh, after many years at Willow Garage, I moved on to Open Robotics, and I've been there ever since, uh, working on sort of core developer for Ross and doing lots of community outreach, et cetera. I was also pointed out that I was involved in the TurtleBot early on. It's been a great platform for teaching uh, people about robotics and how to get involved. So, talking a little bit about Open Robotics, it was established in 2020, sorry, ugh, 2012. Uh, we're just coming up on our 10-year anniversary party next week. It's going to be a lot of fun uh, because we, we were established in 2012, but our first employees started in 20, 20, uh, 2012, yeah. I started in 2013 at Open Robotics. Uh, it's privately held. The parent company is the Open Source Robotics Foundation. It's a nonprofit, 501c3 in California. We have a global team of engineers throughout the world. Um, our headquarters are in Silicon Valley, where we have the majority. But we also have a non-trivial contingent in Boston, spread throughout Europe, Japan, and then we have a second office in Singapore as well. Um, and we're the driving force behind much of the robotic software that's out there. The two projects that I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have Ross and Gazebo. ROS is the world's most widely used robotics SDK, and it's open source with a liberal license for the majority of it. Uh, we support the greater community making their own releases of software, and we'll help them redistribute it, and they can put their own choice of license on it, but we highly encourage. We were originally BSD, and now we're recommending Apache 2 to keep it um, permissive and let people continue to use it on their robots in their applications. Now, in addition to ROS, another major project that we use and uh, both use and develop is Gazebo. It's an open source physics-based simulation for robotics. Um, basically, at every time step, it's doing F equals MA and solving the physics of the system. Uh, this looks a lot like game engines, but we work really hard to focus this onto uh, realism as opposed to looking good and having good gameplay. Um, there are many projects that um, can use Gazebo as a testing platform, and our goal is that the software that will run on the real robot can run on the simulation without any changes. Uh, we're not at the fidelity level that you can tune the robots necessarily in the simulation and then expect it to run in the real world, uh, but if it runs in the real world, we want to have it run in the simulation. This way you can run continuous integration, testing, et cetera. Um, and both ROS and Gazebo are designed in following the open source ethos of having small modular pieces that you can put together and pull apart as you want. So the Gazebo has a modular physics engine. We, have, we actually support three different physics engines. We can change out the rendering engine, say if you want to use the latest NVIDIA hardware with the NVIDIA uh, rendering engines that they provide, you can swap that in and we can make that happen because we're open source through and through down to the core. So just a couple of statistics. Um, our users, our downloads are something in the couple hundred thousand per month, um, millions per year, and we're growing. We've been growing for 
since the beginning of the project in 2008, 2009, exponentially, and it's kind of amazing. I was looking back at some of my slides from 2013, and the numbers were much smaller. Um, we have 19% of our users in the US. It's our biggest market. Uh, Ni China, we're not, the numbers there are large, but the, there's a lot of challenges of getting through the firewall. Open source projects still have problems with visibility into there. And all of these numbers are modular the fact that we are an open source project and we promote people using mirrors and proxies and everything. So these are numbers that are actually hitting our main servers here in the US. We don't know anything about what people are doing on their mirrors beyond that. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background history on ROS, uh, we started off ROS um, at Willow Garage and we wanted to be open source. And what do open source projects do? They go and they release on SourceForge. So that's what we did. We created several repositories on SourceForge and that's where we started using Subversion back in the day. Um, in 2009, we released our first paper on ROS at uh, ICRA, it was a workshop paper. Uh, that paper is now approaching 10,000 citations. I think it's gonna cross sometime later in the year. And in 2012, we started ROSCon. This is a conference like this. We modeled it on this or PyCon to be a developer conference, not an academic conference, where we really want people to come together, talk about how they're using it, and learn from each other. Um, we got to several other milestones here, and I want to point out just this spring, our latest one, we got published in the journal Science Robotics uh, with a talk about ROS2, which I'll get into a little bit later. So at Open Robotics in ROS, we put together a lot of effort into understanding where the robotics industry is going, how do we, can we facilitate it, our goal is just to make sure that open robotics products are as useful as possible to the community. Um, and we have a large suite of tools. The original vision was to provide the LAMP stack for robotics. So if you think of what helped kickstart the internet uh, industry is having the LAMP stack there so you can just take it off the shelf, have your little bit, your idea, put pieces together and deploy it. And so our goal is to have those same things to provide for a robotics application. So if you have an idea of what you want to do with a robot, you buy some parts, you grab some open source software, you glue them together and build yourself an application, hopefully overnight. Uh, we have some good test cases, uh, case studies of um, kind of robots like Tally, which is shown here. Uh, they were able to get to a minimum viable product in something like 18 months when if they went and looked at all the open source software they used, it would have been more like 22 years. Um, and that would allowed one small, small project with three employees to get really far really quickly. And talking a little bit more about ROS, core services for robots that I've been talking about, uh, we like to break it down into four major subsystems. Uh, there's the plumbing. This is basically the middleware, the messaging. It's how things get from A to B. Uh, the infrastructure that we help deploy to the, help people deploy things to the ecosystem. But then on top of that plumbing, there's also tools. We have a 3D visualizer. You can grab it. You can app, create your own plugins for your own data types, but all the default data types have their own plugins already and can just render. Uh, there's capabilities that build on top of that. Uh, two of our flagship capabilities that are integrated are the navigation stack. So if you want to have a mobile robot driving around, the navigation stack is there. You can take it off the shelf, customize it, for, parameterize it for your robot, and it should drive. Similarly, if you want to do manipulation, there's the Move It library and its whole group of packages for ARM manipulation. So if you want to do pick and place or any of those things, there's a lot of capabilities in Move It that you can just pick up and use. And all of these uh, go into the ecosystem where we have we package something like 6,000 different packages for the greater ROS community at Open Robotics. And we distribute those on our servers, use our mirrors at OSL, uh, OSU OSL, and make that available. And this has become a really great collaboration technique for people once they release it and make binaries available that you can just sudo app get install. Um, it's much easier for people to collaborate because you just have the binaries, pull them down, and you don't have to worry about it. I've actually seen people, like you're closely collaborating with people, even like next office, next door. 
I fix, I fix a bug and tell them it's pushed to source. And they say, well, when's it going to be in binaries? I say, next week. And they're like, don't worry, I'll wait. Um, it's just that much easier. So at Open Robotics, uh, we do consulting to keep the lights on. We're actually up to 50 people. And through that, we're always um, supporting companies that are using ROS, and as well as government agencies, et cetera. Um, people, companies come to us to support them to make their product happen. And what we do is we focus on making, finding the things that are pre-competitive for them and not their differentiator so that they can come to us, work with us to build up that core infrastructure and then get their product to market while they retain their IP separately. And we work hard to make sure that everything that we do supports the open ecosystem, if not exact, per, fully open of what we're doing ourselves. Quick slide, thank you to many of our sponsors, et cetera. Um, so now I wanna talk a little bit about where we were and where we're going next. So, ROS is used everywhere, um, land, sea, air, space. It's really awesome. Just to give you some examples, um, we have Apex, COBOL, uh, lots of people doing autonomous driving, indoor robots, logistics robots, all on the ground. Uh, call out some specific ones. Um, ag in agriculture, we've got a couple. And in material handling, that is one, a great large robotics market. Uh, Amazon and Kiva have sort of set the tone, but there's a lot of people that want to do that outside of the Amazon Kiva ecosystem, especially since Amazon wants to keep that mostly internally. Um, but what I want to point out about many of these things, and these, are, these ones I'm calling out are mostly looking back at people who have been using ROS1. ROS1 was developed at Willow Garage, and our original target market was the magic grad student in the lab who knows, can figure out how to make the demo work. And we wanted to very specifically enable them to build robot demos. And that was a very effective thing. We got, into the grad student, get, got to the grad students. We got into robotics research labs throughout the world. Um, and we re, we've actually reached pretty good saturation on the research community for robotics. But uh, the research community is a very small part of the overall robotics community. And so in 2013, we held a workshop called the Ross for Products Workshop. Uh, this was motivated by some of our collaborators at NASA, uh, as well as um, sponsored by Bosch Research in Palo Alto. And they saw that there was a gap between Ross being used for research and Ross being used for products. Uh, the very good um, example of this is Bosch, Re Bosch Research in Palo Alto built an autonomous lawnmower using ROS. They took, built the hardware, put ROS on top, did everything. They had a fully functioning demonstration of an autonomous lawnmower that would mow, uh, mow lawns. And they took it to Bosch Corporate in Germany. And Bosch Corporate says, great idea. We love it. And threw out all their work. Because the product managers at Bosch, Bosch in Germany said this is unproven software, we don't know where it's coming from, it works in research, we're gonna start from the ground up and build it from scratch because we want to do that on this lawnmower. And that's, that is how product companies work. And they were like, oh, that extra modularity you get with the research, uh, that's really valuable for research. Uh, one of the things in the original paradigm writing Ross was that we won't wrap your main. And this was the you can do whatever you want. You can write your main however you want, and we will enable you to do any very powerful things. Uh, but in this workshop, we actually learned that not wrapping our main, while very powerful, is not what product managers want to hear. Product managers want to hear that you will follow a very strict template. It will do all these things, A, B, C, and D, and that engineer one can pick it up. Engineer two, can, or engineer one can write it. Engineer two can pick it up and engineer N five years later will follow the same procedures and policies. And so this is one of the things that we learned from this WASP for Products workshop is that we really need to um, constrain what people are doing actually a little bit more. Uh, we also identified that we wanted to be able to target embedded platforms. Cost is a huge thing for products. Research doesn't care as much. If the one, you're buying one off, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, we also pushed for multi-robot, real-time, and cross-platform 
back in the day, we were purely Linux. So with those, I want to, we came back and reformulated ROS2. And ROS2, we, we basically started from the ground up. We picked a new middleware. And we kept all the standard modularity and have a migration path for people to move from ROS1 to ROS2. Uh, but we really wanted to focus it on being able to support those um, companies going to product. And one of the ones I'm really happy to say is now if you buy a Roomba, an i, I forget which i series, i3 or i5 or higher, uh, it's running ROS2 under the hood inside. And this is something they have said publicly, but it is, you won't find it anywhere in any of their documentation or marketing, et cetera. And this is actually exactly what we identified, and this is, um, ROS is an enabling technology. It is not, and they just use it on the hood because it's more efficient for them to develop and use in their product. They see the lifetime of it, et cetera, coming together, and they're gonna keep using it. And so now we've actually been able to get into the commercial market this way. Um, and it's validating that our redesign of ROS to ROS2 has actually hit the commercial market. And the really cool thing is actually the Create3, which is their educational platform, has a ROS2 interface just to, when you plug into the robot, you just talk ROS2. Um, and so they've actually able to expose that out to the educational research market, but it's just not in the, and it's under the hood in the pro commercial product. Uh, the other one that's picked up ROS2 and run with it in a really great way is Apex.ai. Um, they've taken ROS2 and modified it for their purposes, again, using leveraging the permissive license. And they have actually created a platform for autonomous driving. And they're even looking beyond autonomous driving at just general um, autonomy ground platforms. And this is really cool. They've taken ROS2 and they've actually pushed it through to get ISO 26262 approval as well as ASIL, D, ASIL level D approval in Europe. Um, this is a huge achievement and part of what we were looking at for doing in ROS2 is be able to support people to do this. Um, and it's been, it's been really empowering for us to see this and now uh, we wanna start, now that Apex has demonstrated this is possible, we're now looking at more how we can go in that direction. Uh, so coming back to <clears throat> what I was talk talking about different domains, I'm going to skip C and now focus on air and space um, because we've had a long, long history of using ROS in space. In 2014, Robonaut 2 actually got launched to the space station and is, was running ROS. Um, uh, it's actually interesting, the ROS went up. You can see this Robonaut has some funky legs. Um, Ross went up in the update that brought the legs. Originally, it was just a torso on a pedestal. Um, but they had proprietary software in, that was driving the platform. And the company that was making the proprietary software didn't go under, but they weren't making money on that product, so they just discontinued it. And so NASA actually had to come in and do a full software update on it in space with Ross inside of it. Um, it was definitely not an OTA update, though. Uh, but continuing that, um, jumping forward to 2019, Astrobee is actually on the space station as well, and it's running ROS. These are small little cubes that float around in the space station, and their goal is to be able to do servicing and monitoring, basically, of the space station. They're kind of cool. The early versions of these had little CO2 thrusters. Uh, but these ones actually now have just uh, little fans because you're inside of the space capsule. Uh, you can take advantage of the fact that there's air there and just have little fans that blow air to the side. And, but you're weightless, so you can float around. Uh, it's fun to test that on the ground, though. So we've had this long story, and uh, Robonaut 2 from 2014, I believe they're still using the same version of ROS from 2014. Um, things don't upgrade in space very often. <clears throat> when we look at the, the space, but also in the air, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but with upstairs on the west end of the wing is the PX4 Developer Summit, which go, is going on right now. Um, 
This is a long-standing open source autopilot project. And they, for in their research platforms and commercial platforms, are now integrating ROS. Um, and they've been doing that for a decade. Um, Elroy Air is another cool example. We just found out about this. Um, it's one of the Silicon Valley autonomous uh, vehicle, autonomous flying vehicle startups. Uh, they're focused on doing cargo drones. Um, so you can see this, um, they have that sort of tray on the ground. You fill that up with stuff, the plane will drive over it, pick it up, fly to the destination and put it down and go pick up the next tray. Uh, but the really cool thing is that they were, they've been able to pick up ROS2 and use it, and they're using it for all their ground operations. Um, the navigation stack that I mentioned earlier, they're actually able to just pick that up, parameterize it for this um, uh, airplane, and drive it around on the taxiways and runways. Um, and it's a cool way to reuse those capabilities. And the other thing that PX4 has integrated well with ROS is it's designed to be also modular, et cetera. So we're actually working with the PX4 community to have uh, systems that are hybrid with both a backseat computer that's running ROS and Linux and the main autopilot that's running on a dedicated microcontroller. And the PX4 community and Elroy Air, et cetera, can all just pick up the pieces of robotics that are available from the rest of the community, things like pick and place, machine vision, object recognition, scene recognition. <clears throat> so, going back to space, um, we've been working closely with NASA on various projects. Uh, one of them is VIPER. I forget what the exact acronym means, but it's looking for volatile chemicals on the moon. This is a system that's going to be launching in a couple years. And when they say volatile chemicals, they basically mean water. <clears throat> and we're working closely with them and using ROS on their ground systems for now. Um, as well, we're using Gazebo. Our simulator is being used heavily with them. From a couple, There's been a couple of talks on that. And we're also integrating with uh, CFS, which is the something flight system from NASA, as well as uh, YAMS, which is the mission control system that NASA, this group at NASA is choosing to use, as well as Verve, which is another NASA framework. Um, for missions, then to be on to be on the vehicle and in flight, there's a whole other level, and um, it needs to be flight space qualified. And we've been working with NASA on this one project, but we really want to take it to the next level. And so we have a new initiative that we just announced last year called Space Ross. Um, and basically, we want to take portions of Ross and get them space qualified so that NASA and others can take it out to space. Um, and we're doing this in collaboration. We've kicked this off in collaboration with NASA and Blue Origin. Um, we want to basically be able to have all these reusable modular components in the open source ecosystem available for you or whoever's doing development of tools to pick up and use in their space applications. And once we have that and we have this modularity and we get it to be flight proven, through NASA, it will become much, much easier for doing this. So, <clears throat> as I said, we want it to be qualification ready. So that means that we need to start thinking about how to deal with DO 178C and NPR 7150.2. Um, a lot of this that we're doing right now is to um, do things like static code analyzers, linters, et cetera, to bring the software quality up. We've been doing a lot of this in ROS2 already, uh, but now we're actually going in and saying, what do these standards require? How can we make sure they're there? How can we make a dashboard to convince people that it's actually there? Uh, one of the challenges we've seen with open source software that I'm sure many of you understand is that it's there and it's high quality, but people, you need to be able to communicate that clearly. Uh, so we're working with these teams to do that, as well as when you want to get to space qualified, you need to start dealing with things like memory allocation, exceptions, making sure that you're not doing any of those at the wrong time. So the other thing we're going to need to do is also provide standardized modules that are 
useful in space. Uh, it turns out that nobody else needs free space docking except for spaceships. But those are modules that can be moderately easily, um, software modules that can be moderate, moderately easily written, standardized, and then shared between projects. <clears throat> so what have we been going on now? We have they've set up a GitHub organization. You can go there, test it out. Uh, continuous integration, we have Docker scripts that are, or Docker containers where you can test out the stuff that we're focused on right now. Um, the linters and code quality scanners that we're looking to integrate are many of the ones that NASA uses internally. Uh, most of them are open source, so we're setting up the open source tool chains to just integrate that into our ROS2 development cycle. So that as much as possible, we want all of these qualification and certification processes to be integrated into the larger ROS2 ecosystem, even if we don't push all of the packages to that level, we make those tools available. Uh, one of the ones we've been doing recently is we've been pushing hard to make sure the serif output for static analyzers is universally available in all our different linters and analyzers. And uh, this is actually something that for a long time we've had different linters and analyzers, but they dump out in different formats that are not compatible, and so you can't actually compare apples to apples. Uh, in addition to what's going on, we're also, I mentioned, going and looking, removing dynamic memory allocation where necessary and figuring out how to uh, make sure that that doesn't happen at, during flight, um, improving our logging systems and the dashboard I mentioned for reviewing the serif output so that we can pull everything together and make sure that it's all working together. And so the next steps that we're looking for is more people, more collaborators. Uh, we want to build this as an open ecosystem. And so as we start stepping through this NASA and Blue Origin, we're also uh, looking for other people who would be interested in joining us and going through this process, picking off pieces and building upon this as well. Uh, I mentioned the GitHub organization. Here's a link to Space Ross. Um, Please go check it out there. We'd love to have more contributions, et cetera. <clears throat> well, actually, I'm running a little ahead of schedule. Does anyone have questions at the moment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there like enhancements made in that perspective? Just, just so the certification process can be easy with ROS2? Yeah, so the question is, uh, what in ROS2 helps with the certification process? And um, the, a lot of it is that we've worked hard to build from the ground up with the intention for going towards certification. Um, obviously, one of the big challenges we have is that um, you can't certify software libraries. You have to certify applications and the whole product. And so what our goal is, is that we have, we're going to be working through getting the requirements in there, getting the traceability in there. Um, our goal is to actually set up a full quality management system at Open Robotics to help support the generation of safety documents that then you as a comp company could then pick up and use to support your application for certification. Uh, we've also worked really hard to make sure to keep our dependencies much lighter weight. Um, the modularity is really good for being able to strip down. Uh, we have something like a thousand packages in the main release, but if you say, like, I just need publish and subscribe, you can probably bring it down to like 15 packages. And we're gonna work hard to get those core 15, 10, 15, 20 packages um, up to the certification level, and then you use those in safety critical systems and not the other ones. But I think a big part of this, our push for this, is that we want to make sure to maintain compatibility with the standard open source system, especially wire compatibility. So that if you have a system that you're pushing towards certification, you're running the certified code on it, it'll be wire compatible with the uncertified system, which means that you can break out your developer laptop and just bring up the 3D visualizer and look at what is going on on my system. 
And so we don't, with that sort of separation, we don't need to worry about certifying the 3D visualizer because that's not going to be running on a production system. That's not going to be in the safety critical loop. And so we can have this nice system where developers and researchers can run really deep and really fast. And then we pick the part that's going to be safety critical and make sure to clear that and push that through the process. Um, and the other one is, depending on the standards, I'm going to get in this uh, for shortly, um, different components can be certified at different levels. And with our modularity, you can fo really focus in on that. Yeah? Uh, can you give more information on what is MoveIt? What is MoveIt? Uh, sure. So MoveIt is a motion planning library, I think is the best high-level title for it. Um, and it is a, basically, if you want to have, it's designed to be able to do motion planning for things like robot arms. It can actually be used for full body control, uh, but the most common place is like, say you have a robot arm, it's bolted to a table, you've got some sensors that are detecting the world in front of you, and you want to pick up the can of soda and not knock over the jar next to it. Um, it will let you, it's a bunch of libraries and tools that help you do um, scene recognition, detecting obstacles, detect um, objects that you want to pick up, do collision-free path planning to get there, grasp it and pick it up, and then like attach, we attach the object for path planning to the gripper, and then plan another path to the final destination holding the object with a, that's collision-free. And so it's a framework for doing that sort of operations, those sort of operations. Mm -hmm. So actually, that's back to the, the question is, uh, talk, talk a little bit more about real time. Uh, one of the aspects that we built into ROS2 is we, we built it with the idea that people will want to use it in real time and real time applications. And that is where you need to do things like not have uh, dynamic memory allocation at runtime. And so we made sure that we can do things like you can swap the allocators out and change those inside of the core implementation. Uh, we know that. Um, depending on which standards you're using, using things like the STL is verboten. And so people like Apex have actually replaced standard STD star with their own implementations that are guaranteed to be real time. And we, we've worked hard to make sure that we have the modularity to be able to swap that out. 99% of the people that aren't in a safety critical system are going to want to use the standard tools that come with, the, come with their system. Uh, but we have that modularity designed in because we were thinking about this ahead of time to be able to swap out those components to be able to support real time, et cetera. Cool. <clears throat> uh, any, anything else? So I'm happy to say that we have a new initiative. Uh, we've had the Apex pushed on autonomous cars. We have Space Ross going forward with um, uh, space and aerospace. And we're actually now have, we've had a bunch of outreach based on those previous efforts from, to us from uh, robotics medical device companies. Uh, most of them actually surgical companies because they're the highest level of complexity. And with that high level of complexity, they can actually get to the point that these general purpose tools from the robotics ecosystem are valuable to them. Being able to bring those in and integrate those into their systems is very valuable. And so we're starting a new initiative to start pushing ROS to be able to go through IEC 62304, which is the standard that FA, uh, FDA will want us to standard, um, standardize on. Uh, we're also talking to a couple of European customers, and there's going to be, I think, we're also likely going to push for CE certification as well. Uh, but focusing on the U.S. side, FDA, the IEC 62304, uh, again, the nice thing, I mentioned this earlier, is that we have different levels of certification. And you need to have uh, level A certification for tools that are used to um, support your certification process. But you either need level B or level C for things that are going to go run on device. So our runtime libraries need to be certified up to the highest levels. But things like our build tools and our um, simulations don't need to actually be certified up to that full level. They need to be certified to the level that we know that if they fail, we'll know they failed 
and it won't cause any damage. Um, so the simulation, if your CI fails, um, it's not going to hurt somebody. Whereas if your the arm fails, that's holding the power drill next to a person, um, that's bad. So that we need to make sure that that is safety critical and will not fail. And as I mentioned, we also have the ability to have the all the developer tools. They don't even need to be certified because they won't be on the system and, or used to prove that the system is safe. Uh, again, what we're wor working hard to do is make sure that everything in this actually will be open source. Um, we want to push back as much as possible. There are things that may, we need, may need to have modularity or switch out, things like swapping out STL. We don't want to do that for the mainline developers, but we want to have it that code in the main line so that someone who wants to could just change that pound to fine and swap them out sort of thing. I mentioned we're likely, we're looking to set up a quality management system to help us get there, um, improve our requirements and traceability functionality, and also, of course, testing and coverage. We're going to need to have basically 100% testing on anything that is um, inside of it. And then we will be able to produce safety documents and safety justification documents that we can then provide to um, companies that want to leverage it and integrate it into medical devices. Uh, the business model we're using, uh, obviously we're open source, we love open source, um, but there's a lot of the overhead in this administra administrative stuff to create those safety documents, et cetera. And so we're looking to have all of the core software be open source and available. Um, but if you, and you're welcome to go generate the safety documents, safety justification documents yourself. Um, but we're going to be looking to create those as a product that we can then sell to companies as well as provide support for those systems. So <clears throat> it's an open development process. We'd love to have everyone, anyone get involved. Uh, we're also looking for partners, companies that are looking for using ROS in some of these applications and want to be certified. We're looking to do a collaborative effort where if you contribute up front, you get discounts on the safety documentation. And we have some anchor partners, but we're always looking for more. So uh, if you're please reach out to me. And thanks for listening. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. So the question is, uh, what operating systems are we looking to target? Okay, on the on the micro side. Um, so we have any interest about Q, uh, QNX. Uh, RTEMS is likely there. Uh, basically, anything that has POSIX interface, we can probably leverage. Um, it's mostly going to depend on where people building the products actually want us to go. We're already cross-platform with. Uh, Linux, Mac, and Windows, um, so picking up various platforms shouldn't be too, too bad, especially for the reduced set. Like, we're not going to bring all the GUI tools to your real-time OS, but we expect we can target most of them. I mean, preempt RT, I think, should basically just work. Uh, we run on generic Linux, so if you're using the patch, uh, people definitely do use the preempt RT patch already. Any other questions? Uh, micro ROS, uh, the question is what's the status of micro ROS? It is still active. Um, micro ROS is basically, uh, we're building on top of DDS as our default middleware transport. And micro ROS is taking that and using the DDS, DDS XRCE spec, which is extremely resource constrained environment, AKA a microcontroller and it will connect over a serial port. And so Micro, Micro ROS runs DDS XRCE under the hood and can let you run a ROS type API on your microcontroller that will then talk looking like it's published and subscribing and that'll get forwarded out over the serial port onto the main network so that the uh, other end, it's, uh, opaque to the other end whether or not you're a microcontroller listening over a serial link or you're just listening on a, a UDP port. Um, and that's part of how we're integrating with the PX4 team 
Uh, PX4 is running on the microcontroller, and so we have that serial link that then allows them to talk. Um, but they've gotten fed up with the speed of serial, and they're actually just integrating the Ethernet port. And they're actually going to be, I believe, running uh, micro ROS over an Ethernet port because uh, you can get up to the gigabit speeds. Okay. Thanks again for listening. Uh, I'll be around uh, hanging out if anyone has any questions individually afterward as well.